Hey folks, it's Art Wolf. Welcome. We have an unboxing today and there's a bit of a story behind this particular unboxing because it is an unboxing of a thing that I've had before and somehow didn't do an unboxing of. Uh, this is Barbarossa Crimea. This is a 2010 release from GMT Games and designer Vance Von Boris and it is part of the legendary Barbarossa East Front series. Now I've <coughs> divested myself of this series twice now. Once, many years ago, I owned copies of Army Group South and Army Group Center um, and got rid of those many years ago. And I remember they went for a lot of money at the time. Um, and then not that long ago, in a pay it forward, I gave away my copies of Barbarossa Crimea and Barbarossa Kiev to Rostov. Um, <clears throat> the values on the out-of-print volumes in this series have been very, very high in the past. I'm pleased to note that, with one exception, uh, Army Group Center... Um, that's no longer the case. Um, Army Group Center is still going fairly high. Now, there are reprints of the Army Group North, Army Group South, and Army Group Center games on GMT's P500. They have been there for a very long time. And they are allegedly waiting for the designer, Vance, to, uh, to turn the work into GMT. And I've been kind of keeping up on it lately. And it seems like, uh, based on where my understanding of where we're at, and this, this is you know, last few weeks type of news. Uh, they expect to turn the finished product into GMT this month, is January of 2021, uh, which makes it sound pretty good for a late 20... Um, 21 release of Barbarossa Army Group Center. Um, that is the one volume in the series that is still going for a fair amount of money. It is still going for a lot less than it used to. Uh, I have managed to get copies of every, everything is in a various states of, of on its way. This is the first one to arrive. Um, I managed to get this new, you'll notice it's in the shrink wrap, that's the, uh, and it's out of print, but I, Enterprise Games in Indiana has managed to get this, uh, new for me. I do know that they have several additional copies, again, new, uh, and for approximately the retail price, enterprisegames.com if you are interested. Um, so this is the smallest game in the series in terms of map footprint by a lot. It's a one map game. The rest of the games are at least three or more maps, three to five maps. Um, none of the games are enormous. They're all big in terms of number of counters, but none of them are truly enormous. The uh, the largest ones, counter-wise, top out at under 1,200 counters. Uh, this, I want to say, has three counter sheets. And this is a fairly complicated uh, series. So it's a uh, basically the same scale as OCS, actually. Um, five miles per hex. Units tend to be regiments. Uh, tend to be more regiment uh, scale than division scale, which we typically see in uh, OCS. Um, this is in, obviously, completely pristine condition. Looks like I don't need a knife, actually, to open this, because there's a little rub hole in the front. So let's uh, let's get her open and start looking at the components. And I was surprised going through the channels, like, didn't I do an unboxing of this? And I didn't. I did one for Kiev to Rostov, but not for this. Um, I think maybe by the time this showed up, I had cooled on the series, um, or possibly, because this has happened too, I had cooled on un doing unboxing videos. Um, but that was before I, you know, kind of looked at the analytics and pe people watch unboxing videos, which is great. Okay, so let's see. And, I mean, the box is for... Bear in mind, this is, ten this is an 11-year-old game, okay? This box is relatively heavy, um... For an 11 year old game, and we're going to see that there's a 10 sided die and a roll of bags. We're going to see that the box is about half full, which is a pretty full box, right? All right, and we have one of the old GMT has actually inspected this in house, Cha has inspected this, so that's fantastic, and it's probably correct for that reason. So let's look at the individual components. So, um, this is the Barbarossa Crimea rule booklet, and this is available for download if you want to look at it on GMT's website. Um, this is also the what are called the Barbarossa standard rules, and uh, I'm not sure why this, this is the latest game in the series, right? But I'm not sure why that framing is kind of buried in the book. Um, so what we have is a 36-page, 48-page, 
a 40 page book on sort of a satin finish paper uh, full color but not extensive use of the color uh, or of illustrations like I said it's pretty dense um, I've been reading through the rules for the last few days and just to refresh myself on the series um, and it's fairly dense right it's uh, it's got a lot more uh, rules overhead even though this has 20 fewer pages of rules than say the OCS series rules, I, I feel like this is a more complicated system, less unified mechanics. All right, so there's gonna be a playbook here. Let's look at the playbook next. Because there's gonna be a lot of player aids, I'll, I'll warn you now. Vance has always been very awesome when it comes to including robust player aids. Um, here is the playbook, and there are nine scenarios of which one is the whole campaign. It's a little weird, it's not really a problem, but it's a little weird that the campaign is scenario five and not scenario nine. Um, and this is one map, right? So there's a lot, we'll get, to, we'll get to the way the scenarios are set up actually, it's pretty cool. 56 page booklet on the same sort of, this is a gloss, feels like a glossier stock than the rule book actually. No, it totally is. This is not actually a gloss paper. That's a little weird. Um, but again, not, not really a problem. And again, full color, uh, nice paper thickness. This is probably in that period when GMT was still trying to make adjustments on how they were printing stuff. Um, they seem to have settled on that now. Uh, let's look at the map. Uh, this is interestingly, not interestingly necessarily, but it's, it's a one map game, so I can actually kind of set the map up or at least lay it out, and you'll be able to see not all of it, but most of it. And you'll notice that it is a map of Crimea, unsurprisingly. Let's try and do this in an organized way. Um, almost the entire map is Crimea, and let me reframe this so you can see this. And then you have this differently scaled inset map for Sevastopol itself, because there's going to presumably be a lengthy siege of Sevastopol, as there was historically. So... Uh, I believe the counter map art on this is from Joe Youst, if I'm not mistaken. Is that actually accurate? Map art and design? No, by Todd Davis and Mark Simonich. Uh, Joe did some of the games in the series, apparently not this one. Um, and, you know, it's a kind of minimalist, very traditionalist. There's not that much terrain here. You get some mountains down here and everything else is pretty much open, uh, but you'll end up finding that things like the road lines and the road net and the rail net are of critical importance in this series. So, uh, and those do extend down here into the Crimea. Uh, so that's interesting. So let's look at the counters. And we have, normally I look at the counters last. So there are four counter sheets, but Two of them are half size counter sheets. So this is the old school GMT white core stock, okay? Um, completely standard average counter thickness, in my opinion. And the counters, I think, look fairly nice, okay? We've got Romanians here, we've got Germans here, we have German air, including some Luftwaffe ground units. Uh, we have a couple of SS units, not much. Um, and then we have our Soviets in kind of a, a color that I would describe as orange, <laughs> but some people might describe as brown. I, it, to me, to my eye, in this light, at least it looks orange. And then we have this half counter sheet, which is more Soviet units, a few more German units, um, and railhead markers and rail cut markers for the Soviet side. And then we have this half sheet, which is all markers. Um, so we have roughly a quarter sheet of markers here as well. So there's about two, th uh, about two thirds of a sheet of markers in here. That's not that marker heavy of a game. Um, I don't think, and again, I'm, you know, I I'm going to probably inevitably draw a lot of comparisons between this series in my efforts to cover it again, um, and OCS, because we play a ton of OCS here and I'm quite familiar with it. Um, the unit scale is very similar. The map scale is identical. Um, otherwise, and the topic obviously is fairly similar, but the um, this particular game in the series covers uh, a, a little bit later 
period than most of the rest of the games in the series. We'll, we'll see that in a second here. So let's look at the player rates, because there's a lot of player rates. We have here a double-sided 11 by 17 full color player aid uh, with the TEC, the CRT. So this is good, this is good design here, I, I think. O off the top of my head, not everybody does this. The two things that I'm going to need the most are probably the TEC and the CRT, and those are on the back and the front. And that's nice with your modifiers here. And then inside, we have things that are used probably less often, like the overrun table. There's a special mechanic for overruns. It's not just a combat, which is one one thing that struck me that it's like, yeah, yeah, this is a little, little, little grittier than... Uh, than OCS from a mechanical standpoint. Uh, you have some some uh, guides for some of the bonuses like combined arms, Panzer Division Integrity. I think the Soviets don't have units that give them Divisional Integrity bonuses, but that's something that as the Germans you would definitely want to try to maximize. Um, this is a very ace. All war games are asymmetric, but this, this game is really asymmetric in that um, the two sides don't even have the same sequence of play. Um, they they play very differently. And some people have expressed the um, observation, if you will, that the Soviets are not that fun to play. I'm not sure I agree with that, actually. Um, certainly, if you're playing like the campaign, maybe that's true. But certainly in the scenarios, I think the Soviets are perfectly good to play. Uh, some of the scenarios are Soviets on the offense, for example, in, in situations in which they were historically on the offense and historically won the scenario. So anyway, here's another 11 by 17, and you'll notice that these are numbered too. So the first one was chart and table card one. This is chart and table card two, and it's another 11 by 17 full color. Um, <clears throat> how to read the units. This is this is nice to have, um, although it's fine to put this in the book too, personally, but whatever. Uh, here's some more stuff about movement. Movement is fairly intricate in this game, and I think that is a feature that is often overlooked. The way that movement and trace work in this series is very interesting. All right, so we have here scenario information. Uh, scenario three, Crimea, Road to Sevastopol. These are combined game, VP chart and weather table. By combined game, do we mean combined with Kiev to Rostov? Because you can combine this with Kiev to Rostov, which is the area immediately to the north here. So scenario four, first assault. <clears throat> this looks like just cards for the scenarios with information regarding those particular scenarios. Okay, so those aside. And these are on a different stock than these player aid cards. Th these are on a bit heavier stock than these are. Just a little bit, but it's, it's noticeable to me. And we have scenario card number one, front. Fascinating. Okay, so... Ooh, okay, so scenarios one and two. Here's scenario one, and here's the setup card. And we'll notice that the map for scenario one is right here. This is another thing that this series is really, really good for, is providing you with small scenarios that have their own dedicated scenario map. So you can play, other than the player aids and maybe a display, you can play this whole scenario, which is admittedly a learning scenario. But it's, it, it's not that shitty of a learning scenario, though. Um, you could replay this learning scenario, I, and I could, I, that, that's reasonable. And you can see that it's a four-turn scenario. you got setup cards to put on all the units on, and here is the isthmus that connects the Crimea to the rest of the Ukraine. I'll probably upset some Russian viewer by saying it that way, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> and that's that's the, the Tartar ditch, uh, the line of fortifications that uh, that defended the, the entry into the Crimea. Um, on the other side, we have a slightly larger map. I notice these are bigger hexes too, interestingly. Whereas these hexes are the same hexes, size hexes as are on the big map, but it's a bigger map. Um, this is uh, Odessa, the hero city. So, and you can see this. The other one was a four-turn scenario. This is a uh, this is quite a long scenario, and it's the Romanian attempts to to take Odessa. Um, presumably, we have a setup card. We do have a setup card here for the. Oh, hold on. Yes. Okay. So here's the setup card for for scenario two, Odessa, the hero city. So you could play this whole thing. And again, this is you know this is not a not a little tiny thing. 
Um, it's a you know a lot of units, long game. Um, you can get a lot of play out of this. Um, and you can set this whole thing up on these two cards plus whatever displays and player aids you might need. And there is going to be at least two displays, I think. Um, on this this scenario is going to be the Kirch, whatever it's called, the Kirch scenario. I forget what that is. Um, okay. Scenario card number two back. Uh, so this is the party boss attack. I think that, that is the Kirch scenario, I think. So you'd play this whole thing right here on this 11 by 17 card. I love to see stuff like this, and I wish this is interesting. Ah, there might be two of these. Look at this. There's two different Kirch scenario maps. That's fascinating. They are slightly different. Uh, the this one has a map T holding box on it. Map T is one of the, I think the the other map over here. This this is a strait that can be crossed and historically was crossed when it froze over in the winter time. Um, so this is for scenario seven. This is for scenario two. One of the very attractive things about the series, as as you're probably getting, and here's another one. Scenario four. Here's another Kirch. Uh, scenario. So there's a whole family of Kirch scenarios in here, which I hadn't remembered. Uh, scenario card number four back. So this is probably on the main map because this is Sevastopol, and you're probably playing this on the mostly on the inset map. Okay, and then uh, set up cards for scenarios three and five, and on the back we have another CRT. So you put that under your plexi as well. Here's a setup card for the Axis for Sevastopol First Assault, which is Scenario 4, and then for more for Scenario 5. Scenario 3, Crimea, the Road to Sevastopol, and Scenario 5, the Crimean Campaign. So Scenario 3, I think, is the uh, breakthrough to Sevastopol, and Scenario 5 is the whole campaign. Scenario 4, Sevastopol First Assault. And Scenario 5, Crimean Campaign. So it's tons of setup cards. Here is our turn record track. Uh, let me talk about this last, actually. Uh, so we're going to get these two displays. These, these are the other displays that you're going to pretty much need to play any of the scenarios, with the possible exception of the first one. And these are where your unit statuses end up, right? So air units are in ready, you fly a mission, they go to flown. Or if they get shot down or something or destroyed, they go to these lower boxes. And then you have to move them, stage them up to ready upon which they can um, be brought back in again and used. Um, access unit rebuilding chart. We have an active box, a cadre box, a limited box, and a cannot rebuild box. And the same thing with the Soviets. Uh, yeah, it's identical. And then there are replacement points that you get that you can then bring, stage these units back up. Um, also lets us track Soviet losses and replacements. Um, only the Axis player tracks the victory points. And that's actually not necessarily true in all scenarios. Um, it might be true of all scenarios in this volume, but I think there's one in the... Um, well, it might still be true. There are, there are victory points, and the Soviets got to take victory points in Kiev to Rostov in one of those scenarios that I can tell you about. And then we have a card with... So this is the game that has all the naval rules in it. Those naval rules are supposed to be brought in and integrated into all the games in the series. Although Army Group Center won't really have a use for them, I think, since there's no coastline on that map area. Um, there might be some river action, though. That's possible. Uh, naval charts, which again we'll see. It you'd see in this, this Black Sea Fleet was a was a factor here, and in fact, I think as the scenario starts, the campaign starts, there's a bunch of ships in uh, in Sevastopol. Uh, super heavy artillery, which is another you know I don't want to say unique, but notable aspect of this campaign historically is that they brought this super heavy acti uh, super heavy artillery into barrage Sevastopol. <coughs> All right, so turn record track. The game series uses a unified turn record system. So, so you'll notice that the game starts on turn 60. The campaign starts on turn 60. Obviously, like, Armored Group Center starts on turn 1, right? Which would be June 22nd uh, of 1941. 
Um, this, I think, is the series that is the game in the series that takes it the furthest forward, but that might not be true thinking about it between Kevin to Rostov and Typhoon. Either of those might might take us past January of 42, which is as long as this one goes. Um, by From memory, I want to say the Siege of Sevastopol lasted about 80 days. So um, the Soviets probably... And the colors here... And I, uh, yeah, okay. So there's a climate condition, and that determines which column you roll for weather on. Okay, and the color of the boxes is telling you what the climate is. So this this sort of light tan is dry. This sort of brownish, slightly darker tan is a mud, which doesn't mean there is mud. It just means that there's probably going to be mud. Um, and then this is frost, and then this is snow, and that's also uh, and there are modifiers to the rolls in some cases. So on turn seventy two, you roll add plus one to the roll for the weather on here. Weather is another system in here that's quite intricate, um, comparatively speaking, again, compared to OCS. So um, so this has been a, a lot of stuff. There's a lot of components in all of these games. And um, I, at some point, I'll do a video on rebuying stuff because, you know, I, I, I think it's something that everybody probably does from time to time. This particular series, I've kind of done it. I, I had... Not even thought about it this way, but I've kind of unloaded it twice. So it's not going anywhere now. And, you know, I know there's people that will state a preference for this or, say, OCS or the uh, new uh, game from uh, New England Simulations, Jaws of Victory, or whatever. Um, but I think this game has, this game system has some interesting things to say, and therefore I would like to be able to bring you some additional coverage of it at some point. I will not promise any specific timetable on that, but uh, we'll try and get it, uh, some more out to you when we can. So thanks for watching. Please uh, give the video a thumbs up if you have enjoyed it. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Leave me any questions below. And if you'd like to support the channel, please check out the Patreon and merch store links in the video description. Again, thanks for watching. Until next time, happy wargaming.